Good afternoon, everybody. Um, you can see behind us, we have a really sunny day in Dallas. We're here in Bedford, Texas, on the set for Fishbowl Radio Network. This is Fingerprints of Grief. I'm Kim Francis, and I'm going to be introducing a really powerful guest today that I'm really excited, who is also um, three or four shows into Fishbowl, yeah. new show. Um, and so I'm just going to introduce you, and then I'll, we'll talk a little bit. Um, so Alan Hyde um, has a podcast here at 7 p.m. Central every Friday. Um, so you have an hour after ours, right? So we yeah. get done at 6. And um, we're going to uh, talk to Alan about Breaking the Cycle, his podcast. Um, but one of the things that I think um, uh, we can all say today, there's there's two really tragic events today. And for those of you that were following the Ryan uh, Stein case, the 19-year-old the out of Nashville. Oh, yeah. Um, they found him dead today mm. in the river. And I was really, really sad. And um, he, here's what bothers me about it, you guys, is that he only had one drink at Luke Bryan's bar in Nashville. He was there with his fraternity brothers. He was on a trip. He was texting his girlfriend and his parents. He was a very happy kid. My mom worked for the county attorney for 27 years. I know several police officers and had a conversation with one today. They think that his drink got drugged oh, because when you saw him coming out of the bar, he was stumbling, almost falling over himself. Mm -hmm. And he got kicked out of the bar after one drink. Yeah. So something happened um, and I, they think he was drugged. Now, here's what bothers me. And we're going to talk to Alan about this in a minute. He's a white. 19 year old mm. okay and you've got white and black cops there's good cops bad cops of every race every creed doesn't matter but what was fascinating to me in this age of mental health which we're talking about with you yeah. is that when you see a kid and you know that you're on a um, Saturday night on Nashville on that street bar after bar after bar drinking after drinking after drinking and he gets one drink he gets kicked out of the bar and you literally see the video of him stumbling like he's almost going to fall over and hit his head on the concrete mm. and he keeps walking. And then you see a police officer who t stops and talks to him, Alan. Yeah. He's not in his right mind at that moment. Yeah. So why didn't that officer in the day that we're in, this guy is messed up. I don't know on what. I don't, maybe he's autistic, maybe he's got a brain injury, maybe he's an injured vet. Something is wrong. So why didn't that police officer say, hey man, he just let him go. <clears throat> yeah. And then you see Ryan continuing to walk down the street and disappear. And then what just, I woke up, the, I didn't go to bed last night. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, so we wanna talk about grief, yeah. kind of all over the place. This is a really emotional weekend for me because on Saturday, at 1.57 a.m., my mom will have earned her wings 10 years ago. Mm. So it's a really emotional week coming up for me. Yeah. But it really it really broke my heart when um, I got the AP alert that Ryan was found dead in the river. And what I don't understand is why the officer let him continue to do that, didn't call in a wellness check, follow him, mm. or say, hey, man, you know, can I give you a ride to the hotel? He just let him walk. As a police officer, it bothered me. And then I think, how did he end up at the river, which was three miles away? And then what was so strange, you guys, and, I, and you know, we got to pray for his parents because this is a really sad story. His debit card hmm. was laying on the side of the river bank. That was it. Yeah. No phone. So I think, I'm a little detective, I think that maybe someone followed him at some point. There was probably a struggle. Someone stole his wallet, left the card, and killed him. Hmm. Now, here's what's fascinating about that. Because the police always say there was no foul play. We don't suspect any foul play. How do you know? Right. There's no video of him at the river. There's no video of him after he passed that third block. There's, I mean, we're talking about Nashville. We're talking about there's more homeless in our country, we're talking about the riverbanks of Nashville and people are partying their brains out on a Saturday night, Yeah. right? So it's really, really sad. So I really wanna just say, as we're on this podcast, Fingerprints of Grief, um, that that story has touched my heart and I really feel 
really heartbroken for his family. Another thing that happened today, um, we all have been wondering, you know, the media has been absolutely relentless, and I'm in the media to some degree, um, but I also try to treat people as humans, but we also are in the clickbait society. Yeah. You know, certainly. TMZ and, you know, oh, I saw Alan today. Alan looks sick. Alan doesn't even look like Alan. Oh, that's a stunt double. That wasn't Alan. That was a meme of Alan, and that was a AI of Alan. So poor um, Prince William, um, who lost Princess Diana's mother, and beautiful, beautiful Kate. Um, the media has been hounding her relentlessly. They thought they were doing what they were doing the right way and say she was having abdominal surgery. My initially thought as a woman it was going to be a hysterectomy after three kids. Um, and then she's going to be back on the public circuit in April. Hmm. Well, then if once you leave the podcast and learn about all the stories going around, it broke today that she has cancer. Yeah. And and I lost my mom on March 29th to cancer at the age of 61. Hmm. I but I can't imagine. Let me tell you. And then I'm going to introduce Alan. And we're going to we're going to talk about him. The one thing about grief, you guys, is that when you the the years go by and we never want to say goodbye yeah. it's never long enough but i am sitting here today and can feel grateful and gratitude because i had my mother through my formative years till i was 47 years old i have friends prince william prince harry she was tragically killed they wake up she's gone forever i have a friend that lost um her mom when she was four I have another friend that lost her mom when she was 10. I can't imagine yeah. who I would be right now sitting in front of you if I lost my mom mm -hmm. that young. And so the blessing for me, and I want to encourage people that are listening, none of us get out of here without pain and none of us get out of here without loss and nobody gets out of here. Not any of us can script our lives. Um, Ryan's parents didn't wake up today to the news at 4 a.m. They weren't expecting that he was going to be found dead in the river. Mm. Um, Prince William and them have probably been trying to imagine this overwhelming hurricane that was coming at them. How do you manage it? None of us could understand that kind of deal. But for me, I go, I had my mom for 47 years. And then people that know me know I lost my dad a year ago. My dad was just turned 76. I have a friend that lost his dad to murder at 19. So, so what I want to encourage everybody, and we're going to go into Alan and I'm going to quit talking is that it's really important that when you're going through the high and low tides of grief that there are no rules that's why we come here every week we talk about it real and we're all going to have the roller coaster yeah right so what I can do is go to bed at night and go and I had my mom for 47 years not long enough I had my dad for 75 years and I was blessed mm -hmm. and I know where they are and I know I'm going to see him again for my faith. And there's a lot of people that are hurting way worse than that. So as you get older, as the time span and 10 years for me Saturday, I, I don't cry. I, I don't cry like I used to. I cried last night. I cried a little bit last week. But mostly I, I smile and feel love tremendous amount of love for my parents and blessed for that but for other people I don't want people to feel as we transition to Alan and what he's doing for his career and where he's been and we're going to talk about his story that is really really fascinating and to be sitting here today to like this remarkable man sitting to my right um, when you hear his story um, you wouldn't look at him today and think that's his story mm. Right. So the, the lesson is we all have stories. We're all chapters. We all have the ability to get up tomorrow morning and turn the page and write a new chapter. We don't have to stay in what you're about to talk about in this stuck um, generational curses or my mom or dad abused me. Each person has the power to get the therapy and come see Alan. We'll talk about that. <laughs> and change the trajectory of their life. Yeah. So with that being said, I'm so excited to have you on the show. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about you. Um, and I wanna talk about your journey in California, in Southern California, yeah. and just start telling us um, 
uh, from when you were growing up and how we get to where we are today? Yeah. Um, where to start? I mean, there's a lot of things I could touch on yeah. too, from the clinical perspective. We'll probably of, do a part two with you too, because yeah. I think it'll be important, especially Easter's coming. Yeah. There's a lot of holidays are very difficult for oh, us. Absolutely. That's, you know, holidays are when I get most of my intakes in my clinical practice. Yeah. Well, it's a horrible yeah. time. Uh, yeah. Christmas, the worst. Yeah. New Year's Eve, mm -hmm. but Christmas. Yeah. The, the first week of the year, my phone is Horrific. blowing up. Right. Yeah. And then Easter, you know, Easter, a lot of people, and I, and I want to say this, and I'm not going to interrupt you again, but, you know, I, I don't judge anybody for their faith. Mm. So I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus Christ, but I have friends that are Jewish. I have friends that are agnostic. I have friends that are gay. I'm not going to judge yeah. anybody because that's a personal experience. Yeah. So I didn't want to set this podcast up, even though I talk about my faith, mm -hmm. you don't have to have faith, <clears throat> right? Like you think whatever, whatever your higher power is. I mean, it's, yeah. it's for me not to judge. Yeah. You know, there's a concept I operate with in my clinical practice that, um, you know, whatever it is that you're coming to in the place of your pain, um, the, the problem was always a lack of power right yeah. we as humans are powerless right. you know and they talk about that a lot in 12-step recovery it's like if the problem is a lack of power the solution is a power greater than myself and how you know i, I kind of operate that in my clinical practice of like however you define that as long as it's not you you know right and uh right you know, that's really important yeah people yeah. find a lot of peace in that when they embrace it you know the and lack i think of the way control. you just explain that that is a little counterintuitive to your yeah. al-anon steps a little bit well i've been to a couple al anon meetings yeah. through my brother's brain injury and some addiction but i think remind me the first step is admitting yeah admitting that powerlessness, your powerlessness over alcohol specifically right even as just the friend or family member of the alcoholic right yeah and same thing for me with my brother who has a brain injury i'm yeah. powerless over his bipolar things i'm powerless over watching the chemical deterioration yeah. of the brain damage right so you have to, we think we want to fix it yeah so i think it's just as important and i'll ask you a question in a minute about the family because it's not our job to fix right we, and sometimes you can't fix no i, I would argue we'll go that crazy you never can. trying to fix yeah he has to have free will of choice and you have to sometimes let go and my mom was great at that yeah she'd go to bed and he'd be missing yeah. and i get mad Mm -hmm. And I'd say, how are you going to bed? Right. She's like, because nothing's going to happen between midnight and seven. Mm -hmm. And I'm giving it to God and I'm going to bed. Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't understand that for many years. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was out looking. Yeah. 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 You know, it's kind of like that, that uh, story of the, the young gentleman, Ryan, you know, it's, um, Oh. There, there's not much. Uh, I work with a, a lot of young dudes who are struggling with substances, um, as well as family members of those who struggle with substances. But I also work with cops, and I thought it was a really interesting question because they even bring up, you know, they don't get enough training yeah. um, for like the real world practical problems right. of substance use. And we're in an epidemic in yeah, our society. We we're we're approaching since uh, the year 2010, we're approaching the million people, Mark, that have died of overdose to heroin. And it's like, you know, when, when you look at it from a bird's eye view, that may, that may not sound like a lot when you hear it, but it's, it's, it's astronomical. A it's a lot. Well, let's talk yeah. about the fentanyl. Yeah. And that's, that's one a huge pill. reason. It's a huge one pill. Reason. And I, and, and I want to, and I have a question for you that. So let's, let's go back to Southern California. Yeah. Uh, you're an athlete mm -hmm. and what part yeah. of Southern California? I was born and raised in a, in an area in Southern California called the high desert. So like Victorville, Apple Valley, Hesperia, okay. I was born and raised at a, well, I was born at a hospital uh, called St. Mary's Hospital in Apple Valley. Uh, grew up not too far from there, spent my whole life in the Tri-City area there and uh, got into a lot of trouble there. Uh, made so a lot of friends you, there. So when you were playing baseball, so we're yeah. going to transfer trouble, but so you played baseball because you were very, very, very talented. Yeah. Yeah. You know, very not to talented. toot my own horn, but yeah, yeah, I was good at the game and yeah. uh, it opened a lot of doors for me. Right. So yeah. how old were you when you realized I'm really good at this? And um, when I had a conscious awareness that I was really good at it, I was probably like 10 or 11. Okay. Um, I loved the sport. Um, I played since I was four. So as soon as I could pick up a baseball, I was, that's that, that cool. was it. You were Tiger with the golf club, but with yeah. the baseball bat and the baseball, yeah. right? And the glove, that's cool. Yeah. And so that was it for me. then you're 11 years old mm -hmm. and tell us about your, your family life. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, my, I come from a long line of alcoholics. Okay. Um, you know, even to, you know, to the standpoint of one side of the family never identified it and the other side of the family, you couldn't help but identify it, you yeah. know? And then those two families came to together oh. and merged through my mom and dad. And, oh, um, we got, the, yeah, you got a little yeah. crazies on both sides uh -huh. in different ways, right? Yeah. And then, and then your wife, it's just her mom and dad. So, yeah. 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 You know, wow. and, uh, I saw this thing today, you know, I kind of keep tabs on a bunch of different, uh, mental health concepts, you know, just yeah. in my work week. And, you know, it was like, it was saying the generational pain at some point, someone has to feel it, you know? And, uh, I was talking with a client today in my clinical practice and we were kind of talking about that from the standpoint of, um, you know, just because we can't pinpoint it, let's say three, four generations ago. Feel it. Yeah. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. And infect right. you. Right. It's like, why else? Exactly. Why else were people abusing because you're substances? Because also 8, and, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, there's things that are going on probably around you. Yeah. And I only say this um, because God rest my mom and, and stuff, but my mom was abused mm. sexually. Mm. And I did not know until I was 18 when I called her the B word. Yeah. And she grabbed my little arm and sat me down and said, oh, yeah, let me tell you a little story. And all my friends for years was like, your mom is mean. Mm. She wasn't mean to me, but my mom was not nurturing right. to me yeah. or my brother. Yeah. And that was tough. So what did I become? Type A, mm -hmm. codependent, yeah. enabler, right. five-year-old mom. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Five-years-old mom. Yeah. Through therapy and all, you know, and, and when my mom was on her deathbed, we had amazing talks about this. She didn't know what she didn't know. Yeah, they have their limitations and... That's what, you know, yeah. um, I'm sure we'll get into, but I'm, I'm in a 12 step program. Um, you know, I won't identify too much just for the anonymity purposes, but what I've learned through my 12 step recovery journey is, you know, um, my parents aren't perfect people. They have their limitations, but they're not monsters. That's right. You know, that's right. Yeah. And that's the end of the day. They're people. Yeah. They didn't know what they didn't know. Right. Right. They just did the best they could. Yeah. And to raise you to have food on the table and clean mm -hmm. clothes and have a bed and a roof over your head. Yeah. You can't blame, yeah. you know, they did the best they could. My mom was a lioness, like she was a single mom. Mm -hmm. She worked three jobs, I never knew that. Mm -hmm. I never wanted for food. I always had clean clothes, I had clean sheets, I had a house, mm -hmm. wasn't much, but we had a clean house. Yeah. And I wore JC Penny plain pocket jeans when all the girls in sixth grade had Glory Vanderbilt. Mm. And I used to get really mad because yeah. I wanted Glory Vanderbilt and that peer pressure. And my mom's like, um, yeah, sorry, you know, right. it's the world. So you're so you're eleven, you realize you're good. Yeah. Okay, I, go I into had, high school. Uh, yeah, you know, I um I came into my own baseball wise, you know, when a lot of the young kids had natural talents. I was a big kid, so I oh, was yeah, a little you're bit tall. lanky. How tall are you? Yeah, I'm six foot five. Oh yeah. Yeah, so that that was kind of like the <laughs> the that was the Were door. Were you like the guy in the me. green mile on the baseball field with all the <laughs> yeah. other kids? <laughs> yeah, when I hit my growth spurt. Yeah, I. Um, so, They're like, oh, there's Alan. Uh, can I hit it over Alan? Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. My uh, so my freshman year, I made it to uh, the last day of tryouts. So I was my freshman year. I was 13, turning 14, and uh, on the last day of tryouts, I got cut. And I remember thinking, <gasps> like, I'm it's over. You know. Oh, it, why'd you get cut? Because you, do you feel like it was your size? Well, you Did know, you intimidate the coach. Well, I hadn't hit my growth spurt yet my okay. freshman year, and I was still young. You know, and I also at that time. So what would develop in my baseball career is I became a pitcher. Uh, at that time, I was not trying out as a pitcher. You know, I was a third baseman at okay. the time, and I was an average. Okay. You know, I could hit, but. But how old were you? Thirteen. Yeah, I was you about to turn fourteen. But you were crushed. Yeah. I thought, well, I remember reading the list on the, in, oh, you know, the I locker room. That and just crushed. Yeah. I mean, all my friends that I played little league with my whole life, you know, Were they're you the all on the team. Didn't make it? Yeah. Out of the group of like the core guys I played with my whole life. And, oh, um, that's hard. And you're yeah, 13, you're going through puberty. Yeah. Oh yeah. gosh. So what, so how did you, how did you, how, who helped you through that knowing that you weren't developed yet and then to become a pitcher? Because yeah. that's a lot on a 13 year old boy. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is the, the high school baseball coach, um, at that school, he had left the year I was coming in my freshman year and I used to do private baseball lessons with him growing up. Okay. And so, um, <clears throat> he had gone to the junior college to coach there and he called me and he said, Hey, you know, it's not over. Just, you know, go Good get into him. little league. 
and uh, my he, dad like, he coached you yeah you know and then my dad was really supportive he he took me out that night and and uh, we went down to the field that was around the corner and just we, you know we did some practicing that's and, amazing so yeah. they recognize now it's a le- teaching opportunity yeah and we can coach him and mentor him to show him this is not the end yeah that's amazing i owe a lot to you know with all the things that I've given my dad a hard time about, I mean, that guy supported my baseball career like nobody else. Well, I'm sure he was proud yeah. of you. Yeah, he yeah. really was. That was and a big deal. Yeah. So um, so this coach takes you under his wing. Yeah, you know, he had already coached me all through middle school, um, and he was go- going on to a new venture in the at the junior college. And so he was, you know, at that point hands off, but, you know, was yeah. in touch. And, and so I took his words to heart. He said, look, just go back, get into Little League, uh, have another you know year of playing ball and come back your sophomore year and pretend like it didn't happen, uh, and that's what, what I did. A wise man. Yeah, that's and that what I and did. you took that as word. Yeah. So I uh, in between those years I uh, I aged. I hit a growth spurt. I grew so fast that I tore my oblique. Um, oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so you know there's a lot of growing pains. I got water on the knees too. Like when you grow oh, that like, fast. I mean you're like grow like I mean. Yeah. I'm much older than you, but it reminds me of like, you know, kind of like the Jolly Green Giant, right? <laughs> yeah. Or Jack and the Beanstalk. He grew yeah. so fast yeah. that like your body probably couldn't keep up. Right. That was hard, huh? Yeah, it was rough. Um, but it also, it changed my baseball career because I came back my sophomore year and I try it out as a pitcher and I got on the mound and the moment I got on the mound, they were like, after I threw a few pitches, they were like, hey, why don't you come over and practice <laughs> with the varsity team? And uh, and that was it. That was all she wrote. So how old were you then? Uh, I was about to turn 15. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about as we went okay because yeah we know where we're going on your bio the audience doesn't so right. walk us through 15 what happens yeah so i started hanging out with a pretty rough crowd the kind of guys were like um i took a turn my freshman year um where i was doing the little league stuff but i also started hanging out with a, a much rougher crowd of dudes because the kind you're with of, varsity well th- so that the freshman year before my sophomore okay. year was you know i was okay. in high school i started yeah. hanging out with dudes that were older while guys were at baseball practice i was you know until little league started up i was doing questionable things um and was uh that peer pressure or yeah was certainly it, and was it loneliness yeah you know i want i was to fit in on i wanted team? to fit in somewhere yeah yeah and i had fit in on a baseball field my whole life and, and you didn't have anywhere to fit in, in that. yeah and uh I, I fought a little bit too much um, when I was early in high school, just being a bigger kid. And, uh, you know, you go to high school, you got some older guys. They want to test their testosterone. Oh, yeah. Of course. The and, bully. Uh, and yeah. The, the, yeah. You, you yeah. got. Did you guys have back then like we did? We had kind of had the jocks, uh-huh. the, you know, the, the, yeah. the, you know, that whole kind of clickish. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I settled in with a crowd that, you know, remained my I mean, some of them are still my best friends to this oh, day. Good. Yeah, have really put their lives together. Phenomenal men, and uh, but they were the the dudes that my baseball teammates were afraid of, you know. And it worked well. You know, it worked out in this way. As my my older brother, I went to high school with as well. But my older brother's gay, so he got picked on a lot. Oh, yeah. And so there's, did you protect him? Yeah. So there's there's um, one thing I can say is like him and I can rag on each other, but, but if anybody else, else called yeah, my brother you better, gay, you're gonna deal with Alan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I had a bit of a temper back then. I mean, you know, it's a, I was growing up in an untreated alcoholic home, yeah. mostly Alanonic issues because my parents didn't use substances, but it was untreated. Okay. You know, so a little chaotic. A lot of it was very loud anger, in my home. Yeah, loud, a lot of anger. Slamming. So I took it out on on people who picked on my brother, of and course. I was good at it. Yeah. Oh, I bet you were. <laughs> yeah. Did you get suspended? Oh yeah, yeah. I almost got expelled my uh, freshman year at the end of the year, um, and that kind of woke me up a little bit. But um, as high school progressed, uh, I, I was you know getting really good at baseball. People were starting to take notice. Uh, but my my sophomore year, after I made the team, I was pretty much instantly on the team. Uh, tryouts were going on, but I wasn't at tryouts anymore. Yeah. I was practicing. Yeah. Uh, and then the first grades came through for the check, and I was I was on the cusp of a 2.0. And my math teacher, this is another funny yeah. side note, was going to fail me. And my dad came into the class, uh, you know, to talk with her and said, fail him. So he learns a lesson. 
Wow. Yeah. And so she, she did? no, so she looked at me the next day when I came into school. She said, The only reason I'm giving you a D minus is because your dad was holding you accountable. And I ended up getting like a B in that class because I was like, Well, you know, he can't. So the agreement was if she was going to give me a D minus, that um, my dad had to come into the class three times and sit in the back of the class while my classmates were in there. Did he? <laughs> and he did. Wow. <laughs> it's the most embarrassing thing. But oh, I, yeah. I look back and. But your dad, your dad knew. Like, oh, yeah. You do this is there's a consequence to your yeah. actions and you, yeah. yeah um okay keep going because I, I have another question later and we're going to be doing part two with that one so yeah. keep going so, yeah, so, so you're hanging out with this bad crowd yeah you know not the worst dudes but their older brothers were pretty rough and um and was you know, it a lot of drinking and drugs or just pushing the needle yeah pushing the needle is a lot of alcohol um my my best friend in high school, his name's Andrew, he, you know, would turn out he was a pretty vicious alcoholic and uh, like really, really balls to the that, walls. How, how old? He, he was a year older than me. So uh, when when he really started drinking, he was probably like 14 and a half, 15. That, but, but that is so crazy. Yeah. That you have a vicious alcoholic at the age of 14 or 15. Yeah. Now, did he have a troubled home? Oh, yeah. Very. He's okay. adopted. Very, you know. So there was something uh, you know, else going on, and that was an escapism, which yeah. we know in brain injury medications, even with my brother, and he knows that we talk about this, is that um, they want to medicate. Yeah. And that is alcohol. Right. And my brother, unfortunately, <laughs> when he would have half a beer mm -hmm. with 47% of a front left brain gone, yeah. half a beer would equal 25 mm -hmm. yeah. out of his mind. Yeah. And so, and then I couldn't. It was bad. Yeah. Like bad. So that kid, 14, 15, vicious alcoholic, that's yeah. a major, major, that's sad. Oh, it was, a, it was an issue. And I think we all knew it was an issue, but we didn't know what to do about it. Um, because and, you're, well, you're kids. Well, yeah. It's like, uh, that's where my al -anonic issues, you know, started. first really started to present themselves where I could kind of see them. I would try to help fix and save all my friends. I was that friend in the group. Oh, you that know, would I, have been me. You were the codependent yeah. trying to save them and help yeah. them. And I was then the you sober struggled one. inside. Yeah. So you were sober. Yeah, I, bar I very rarely... There was a couple times, like I remember the first time I drank to blackout, I was 13, and I knew it was a, a, just a massive problem. You didn't like it. No, I hated it. Hated it. So you didn't have an alcohol issue? No, I've, I've never had an unmanageable. You had unmanageable. an anger issue? Yeah. Yeah, I had a control issue. I wanted to okay. control my friends. Okay. They would get okay. out of control, and, and I'd be the and ringleader. And the six-foot-five yeah. giant's going to, I'm going to control you. Yeah. 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 So, okay, so let's keep going because you were getting in trouble yeah. with so the I, law. Yeah. So okay. um, then my senior year rolls around and with that group of guys, we got arrested probably, you know, like detained, you know, for, for minor vandalism stuff a couple of times. Um, and then one night um, I decided uh, I was going to hang out with kind of like my really rough friends that have a lot, like a lot of problems going on. Yeah, keep going, Alan. Yeah. No worries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I I, oh, yeah we got a little bit. Yeah. We're live, people. We're live. Live, <laughs> yeah. live, live radio. Go ahead. Podcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I remember my, my best friend, Jerry, we talk about this every now and then. Uh, he was hanging out with my best friend, Cody, who two of just the most phenomenal dudes who've really put their lives together from where we came from. Uh, but they called me that night and I decided, hey, I'm going to go hang out with these other guys that I know. And, and they told me straight up, they're like, why? You know, they're skid marks. What are you doing? You know, and, and I was like, ah, you know, I've been hanging out with you guys a lot lately. I haven't seen them in a while. And so but they uh, had a, yeah, they knew that this is not good for Alan. Right. Yeah. Especially Jerry. Jerry is, he's a year older than me. So our senior year, I was 17. He was 18. Uh, he's always been wise. You know, I mean, he, he made a lot of his own mistakes too, but he was kind of the friend I looked up to. And he also realized he couldn't control you. Yeah. So he could give you words of wisdom and yeah. he would say, Hey man, can you stay? Yeah. He probably felt helpless too. Cause he's yeah. like, I want him. Why won't he listen to me? Right. So yeah. what happened? So, um, these other guys were pretty manipulative in nature and I knew, I knew that about them. I'd known them since middle school, that yeah. kind of stuff. But we, we went out, uh, and we had this hangout spot behind a church. It was a Mormon church in my hometown and we got plastered drunk. And, uh, one of them was like, I bet you can't, uh, hit the window, the big stained glass window on the side of the church. And, uh, -oh. uh 
you know, we're already throwing rocks at this point. I didn't, I, I wasn't keeping track. I was drunk and, uh, I was like, I bet you I can. And as soon as the rock left my hand, I knew I screwed up. Uh-oh. I mean, it, like the one thing my, you're sc- a pitcher. Yeah, well, you're six, five, yeah. you're a big dude. Like you have a powerful arm. Yeah. And, Uh-oh. and my aim, that's the one thing that carried me through my baseball career you, is like, I like just the, threw sniper. strikes. Yeah. I, yeah. I had impeccable. Sniper. Yeah. yeah. And, Uh-oh, uh, so did it shatter the whole like window? It hit the top middle of the window and the whole thing came shattering down Uh-oh. and there was people in the church and I remember seeing their face and they had, they, they were already all on the phone. Cause like, you they know, were in the church? yeah, they were in the church. There was probably like 10 or 15 of them. Was and, it, was a weeknight or uh, I can't even like remember. Like a Wednesday night, maybe yeah, people were in the yeah. church. So it fell on them. Yeah. It might've been a Friday night but or it something. it fell on them? No, not on them. Oh, just God. in front of them. Okay. Oh yeah. They're yeah. calling the police. They had already been calling the police cause apparently we had done damage to the cars by throwing rocks over there. Oh, no. Um, because you know, it's all a bit of a blur, but yeah, as, course, as soon as the you window, were, how old were you at this point? I was, uh, I had just turned 17. Okay. So you knew yeah. you're in big trouble. At this oh point. yeah. Yeah. And like not even 10 seconds later, the blue and red lights, you know, are yeah. coming around the corner. So you get arrested. Yeah. So we booked it. Um, and we went to try and hide in this apartment complex and we went into an abandoned apartment and they caught us right away. And so the charges were, um, public intoxication, vandalism and breaking and entering. Uh-huh. And, uh, and we were arrested arrested and Handcuffs they have behind your back uh-huh. in the back yeah of the face car, in the concrete fingerprint yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. so the whole deal and uh i was the only one who was underage so they were all 18 i was 17 and oh, uh Alex. yeah you must have been like uh oh yeah so you were scared well yeah i got detained separate from them in the drunk tank like in the main because police station underage, yeah. yeah and um <clears throat> when we went to court uh, i remember the judge uh, he's like, look, I need you to be plain honest with me. What happened? And I just told him, I told him the right. best of my recollection. And I was just honest. And, uh, all the others had blamed it on me. Um, oh, so yeah. So here you go. Yeah. Cause it's like, so you learned that lesson too. Like yeah. they weren't your friends. Yeah. They were, they apparently save their own butts. Yeah. They, when they were locked up the night before they we're were like, we'll put Alan. it on the yeah, 17 year old and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, which but you were honest with the judge. Yeah. I bet the judge sniffed that real quick. Straight up. Yeah. yeah. He was like, um, he said, look, this kid's being honest. These yeah. guys are hoodlums. Yeah. And I had been in front of that judge before twice, <laughs> but I, yeah, bet, so. I bet that judge knew that you were a good kid underneath that. Yeah. You know, he looked at me, he said, look, young man, if you remain this honest in your life, you're going to be okay. And, uh, and that is good. I, yeah, he was a good guy. And, uh, my dad was pissed, but he got over it. And, uh, <laughs> and so did I. Um, but yeah, there was restitution, community service, you name it. Um, but the biggest hit was, um, I had some college opportunities for baseball that completely fell through. Um, yeah, they, so I was supposed to go to some tryouts, uh, in Southern California and I was in touch with a a coach out of the state. You were 17. Uh, it was my senior year of high school. Wasn't a felony, was it? No, it was a misdemeanor. So why, why would they didn't want anything to do with someone that's getting in trouble with the law boy that's changed in the mlb nfl and all that today it's, especially it's in the NFL. Right? yeah i mean let's look at some of these guys that beat the crap out of their girlfriend 17 times and they still play again yeah you know i, I i'll put I, it I, I, that makes me mad well you know there there might have been a time and at that time i was um but as i look back i put it like this uh they didn't I want see, to take that risk well they didn't and i see god's hand in my life you know, I needed, I, I needed to be held accountable. You needed to be held back. Yeah. Cause I, I was, I was in and out, you know, of getting kicked out of my house. You know, um, I was too much at that time. I was six foot five, had no concept of how big I was either. I was getting in trouble in ways that I didn't understand. And I was putting my, my family in harm's way. So your brother at the time, yeah. how did that impact him? Well, my brother has had a unmanageable problem with substances since he was probably 13. I remember when we were kids, I used to find the empty beer bottles in his closet and you know, um, but he was also dealing with who he was he yeah. trying to understand that from a puberty growing up, yeah. you know, a tri- that kind of thing. Right. Yeah. It's, it's one of the most challenging relationships. And I haven't talked to my brother, shared words with him in almost three years. Mm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. It's, it's unfortunate. Um, my sister's kind of in the same boat. Her and I are two peas in a pod. She's also a therapist. 
Um, well, you guys yeah. are grounded in reality yeah. and also grounded in the tools that help you work through things. Yeah. He's probably, un- that's a, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. And that, that those years in high school, um, well, a lot of people thought he was my little brother. That must have been hard. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all the things. But I remember there were shifts in our relationship in high school where like, you know, he, I'd find out from his friends, he was talking crap about me, that kind of stuff. And I just, I didn't know what to do with it. He didn't either. Yeah. It just was a rough time. It was probably just, it was a a protection mechanism within him to try to fit in. Yeah. And it wasn't that he didn't love you. He just was trying to fit in. Yeah. You know, my, my brother, the way I put it is like, uh, one of the funniest, most gentle hearted people, but his addiction does something to him that I can't, I can't go down that road with him. I get you. I get you. So, um, so then what happens? You got held back baseball. That must've hurt. Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was rough. It was almost graduation. Baseball season was pretty much over. It was, it was time to make your decisions for college. And so, uh, one of the coaches I was supposed to try out with calls the coach, uh, who used to coach at uh, BYU, Mm -hmm. um, in, in Utah, who is now transferring to be the athletic director and baseball coach at this little junior college called Barstow community college in the middle of nowhere. Where was that? Uh, it it was probably like 45 minutes from my hometown. Yeah. In the middle of the desert. Like it's the way I described is it's like in the middle of nowhere on your way to Vegas from like LA, you know, just (laughs) dirt, you know, meth labs and dirt. Oh my God. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. And then a little junior college. Is that where you went? Yeah. So he called me. So, so he called me and he said, uh, I love it. No, nobody. You're like, okay, God, what's this? You know, look, God, he's going to put me in the middle of nowhere Yeah. in a monastery almost in the middle of nowhere with tumbleweeds on your way to Vegas. Right. That's hilarious. He was the best, the best coach for me at the time. I mean, he said, look, man, you're, you're a hell of a ball player, but you're an idiot. (laughs) Was kind of the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when I came in, um, I mean, I kid you not, I was probably the only one in the fall who could even play catch. You know, it was not a good baseball team and he was turning it around and, uh, and dreams. yeah. And, and he told me straight up when I came in, he said, here's how this is going to go. You're going to sit in the front row of all of your classes and I'll make sure that you are, you'll go to the study groups and you will not play for me until I trust you. You'll sit on the bench and you'll cheer your teammates on. Yeah. And he stuck to that. I mean, we would get our ass kicked and like all the dudes that I had like started getting close with, they'd be like, just put him in. He's, you know, he can he play and he wouldn't do it. Um, Good for him. Yeah, he, he stuck was. To his principles. Yeah, he, at the cost of losing. Yeah, yeah, and because we lost. He knew the, <laughs> but he knew the bigger lesson. Yeah, yeah, he knew that if I could put my head on straight, that that I could help him be a, 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 a solid part of the team. So here we go. Yeah. When does the baseball team start turning around? Because you start buying in, and then they yeah. go put him in coach, and then yeah. you, I bet you blew it up. Yeah. So his his whole. MO was you change for college. College doesn't change for you. And I kid you not, I'd have an 8 a.m. class. I'd look up in the little window in the door and his little face is right there. Good for him. He was just a phenomenal man. Oh yeah. Yeah. Coach Mike Carpell. Yeah. Coach Mike, we love you. Oh, I love him to death. He's a great man. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So then, so then he puts you in. Yeah. So it gets into the regular season. We lose our first game. Second game comes around. I'm cheering on teammates. We're losing. Uh, He looks down the bench and says, you're in. And, uh, Uh and the team's going, yes. Yeah. And we ended up winning the game and, uh, uh, and then you start yeah. winning, winning, winning. Yeah, so I became what we call our ace there for the two years I was there. Uh, I had led study groups, so I became basically our team captain. That was, you know, how coach I love referred it. to me. I and, love uh, it. Yeah. So you, okay, speech communications. Yeah. So I, tr- and, yeah. Because I, because I find this fascinating that, you know, we go back to the beginning when you're like, I wasn't sure, you know, what I was going to do. So I think for anyone listening that either has an addiction Mm -hmm. um and a lot of times in grief yeah you know i say like there are no rules but with if you get to a point where you're staring down shopping addiction sex addiction Mm -hmm. drug addiction alcohol addiction yeah it's time to get help oh yeah so so that coach was pivotal in your life yeah you know i think if a few of those things like with the judge or you know um getting arrested some of those coaches not taking a chance this coach showing up when he did i think if some of those things hadn't turned out yeah. I, I, you know i, I would have turned to other distractions a hundred percent yeah yeah i think there's a great book I'll, I'll have to get you one um when we do your part two um called when god winks 
Oh, okay. And it was written by Squire Rushnell, and he talks about the power of coincidence, but there really are no coincidences. Yeah. And it's sort of like the movie Sliding Doors. Yeah. You, I leave this studio, and I see a piece of trash in the middle of the hallway. I can stop and pick it up and do the right thing and throw it away, or I just keep walking. Yeah. Well, some, there's going to be a cause and effect of that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or I miss the train. Sliding doors, Gwyneth Paltrow, she missed mm -hmm. the train. Her life went this way because she missed the train. She got on the train. Right. It's really fascinating. Yeah. So speech communications, and then yeah. you got your master's in uh, science of clinical psychology. How did you settle on that? Did you say, I want to help people? Um, so what, what ended up happening after, that, so that was junior college. I played two years there, and then I transferred to the University of Laverne, which is a, a small private school. So but baseball. Yeah, and they're, they're consistently ranked in the top 15 in the U.S. for Division Three. The coach there, Coach Scott Winterburn, he's in the Hall of Fame for NCAA. That's amazing. He's a wonderful, wonderful coach. So I mean, your best trajectory is I want to go pro. It was at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, as you, as, as I got older, I, I realized, you know, you start climbing the ranks and, and I was good, like really good. Yeah. Um, but you get into those levels and you realize like now, now you're starting to talk about the best in the world. Right. Because and, you're getting the Dominican Republic. Yeah. You're getting, I mean, around the world and yeah. people are going and plucking them and bringing them over. Yeah. yeah. And then I had an incident, you know, which wouldn't, wouldn't have been a bearing whether or not I was going to go pro, but I had an incident between my sophomore and junior year when I was transferring yeah. where I tore the hemorrhoid head of my bicep tendon, oh, a micro God. tear. Oh, yeah. That's not good in baseball. As a yeah. Picture. And yeah. I never threw as hard again. Yeah. Um, in fact, like before I told anyone I was injured, I came in as a transfer and they would joke at how slow I was throwing because I, I, I was hiding an injury at first. Okay. And my coach knew it right away because he had saw me play. So yeah. he's like, what is wrong? And you know? Yeah. yeah. So you and played so, for two years there. But then, but then mm -hmm. the clinical side, when did yeah. you decide the clinical psychology and then starting to get into the therapy realm. Yeah. So I, when I graduated my undergrad, um, realizing like baseball's done, um, I had had some pivotal experiences at Laverne, uh, with, you know, not just public speaking, but, uh, I was, I was a president of the student athlete advisory committee. So, Good. yeah. So I was really used you're to really like growing up here. Yeah. What you're doing. Yeah. And like you're leaps the right and bounds choices and you're, yeah. you have a trajectory and you have a path and you're yeah. starting to see these things come together that if I follow this path, right. like things were happening for the good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I kind of settled into a role where, um, I was the guy that people trusted off the field. It, it just, my whole college career was mired it. with that. I I, yeah. I was that teammate that people liked. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I really found my identity in that aspect of my life off the baseball field for the first time. Well, and I think, um, in listening to the beginning of your story and you wanted to be the friend to fix your friends. Mm in that transition like you i almost feel like i feel like you know outsider looking in that god took those those puzzle pieces that yeah. you didn't know how they fit yeah. and used your strength and your height and your right. as kind of like a team dad in a way like yeah. I, you know something happened when i want to go talk to alan so yeah. you became the leader of the team yeah in that very specific way and and we had I a bet real that made you feel good though yeah it was it yeah. was we had a really good senior class, um, just some of the most wonderful dudes, and we were all leaders in our own right. And you still see in touch with a lot of those guys. Yeah, well, we won a championship together that year. Okay, so that, well, there you go. Let's the, go. Nice. Yeah, cherry on the, t okay. on the cake, yeah. With that coach. Yeah, with well, with uh, Scott Winterburn. Okay. Yeah. Who's in the Hall of Fame. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and he's won many championships, but it was – we it was – Interesting because we weren't like the we were a ragtag group of dudes, but we we very much filled roles, you know, yeah. and and that's why we won. But and I okay, so because we're doing a part two, mm -hmm. um, you um that is so cool because when you think of Hoosiers and you uh -huh. think of um what's the football movie I'm Denzel Washington. Oh, I um, remember the Titans. Yeah, yeah it's I mean, a good listen. One. Same yeah. thing. And then mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw the basketball documentary about the University of El Paso. The oh, yeah, White yeah. versus the mm -hmm. Black, right? Yeah. That, he, that coach knew what he was doing. Yeah. yeah. At the expense of the kids didn't know. He saw the strategic vision mm -hmm. of the puzzle pieces. You yeah. guys, it came together. It did. 
Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And yeah. being a part of a lot of those things is yeah. what, you know, I've looked back and, and that informed a lot of becoming a clinician, but I, I didn't grow up wanting to be a no. therapist. I had never thought about it. Right. I didn't even study psychology in my undergrad. Um, so I did, I, I remember in the interview process, I, I asked them, I said, is this where you like sit across from people and ask them how they're feeling? And they got the biggest <laughs> kick out of that. <laughs> Years later, when I graduated my master's program, is this where um, I have a couch and I come in and exactly. tell me how you feel and kick the key feet up and you've got your notepad over there, yeah. like in um, I forget which HBO show it was with the therapist, but anyway, yeah, yeah, I did an exit tell me dinner. How are you feeling? Right. How are you feeling today? Yeah, I feel like shit, dude. <laughs> yeah. So you know, three years later, when yeah. I'm graduating the program, I do an exit dinner with like the the chair of the program and a few of the others who had interviewed me back then, and they said we just wanted to see what a young athlete coming fresh out of a sport would do in this field we just were interested and uh oh, and it ended up cool. yeah it, it it ended up well it, it has I, I it's my it was my first career it's will be my only career i love it to death i am beyond blessed to be a therapist and to have been a therapist in some of the times that have happened recently um oh my, gosh. my goodness i mean what a godsend i i I often talk with other therapists that came in when I did of like what a blessing it was to be not just a therapist, but like I was also a seasoned therapist at the time when COVID hit. I was just going to yeah. say, yeah. so I can't wait. So, um, tell everybody real quick, cause this is what we're going to do. We have four minutes. <laughs> We've been flying. But I love it. But if you will, if you will, um, I know next Friday is good Friday. Are you doing your show? Yeah. Okay. You want me, me to come in for a part two? Let's do part two. Okay. And I think it'll be good for me because I think with it being a holiday, yeah, there are there are, God's timing is always perfect. Yeah. And that next morning will be the ten year anniversary of my mother, so you can help yeah. me a little bit. All right. But I think it'll be fun to um, to go into part two, especially talking more about you work with veterans, you work mm -hmm. with um, addicts. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's so inspirational. And I think for anyone listening, like I'm so inspired. Thank you for lifting me out of kind of the pit today with mm. Leo Ryan. And well, thanks for having me just here. Just make made me sad today, you know. Mm. And um, and I didn't get any sleep because I was working <laughs> up like a zombie. Um, but I'm so excited about like you use in your journey of recovery called transformative. Yeah, that's a really important word, yeah. and I want to pick that up next week. But transformative. So so this interview has helped transform my attitude. Mm of Good. how I felt today. I'm glad to hear that. Down yeah. and sad because I'm an empath. Mm. And I I still cry over the Uvalde kids. Yeah. It's hard for me. Like I feel helpless in that situation. Yeah. So the fact that next week I want to talk about because you are you then COVID <laughs> happens. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, yeah, and wow. I, People, I, people abuse increased oh my gosh yeah. sexual trafficking increased mm -hmm. um prostitution increased um uh domestic violence increase yeah drug abuse increased alcoholism increased i mean it was a hard time yeah i was working in treatment at the time and the anxiety levels and just to be yeah in a balanced place to um to help people stay grounded during a time where none of us knew what was going on. Did you do on. Zoom therapy sessions? Uh, we did. Okay. For, um, I also kind of around that time started my private practice. Okay. So I had some private clients that I saw in person and some I saw on okay. Zoom. And then every now and then we'd run group on Zoom depending on Good. what the regulations were. But yeah. yeah. That's amazing. So um, we have two minutes. Tell us how, how do we find you on social? Yeah. And um, I want to encourage everybody. So we're live, and then um, Alan takes an hour break, and then yeah. you come on at seven to eight. Yeah. Live, um, yeah. breaking the cycle. Breaking the here cycle here on Fishbowl Radio Network, so you can yeah. come back on Facebook. Yeah. And then, um, but how do people find you? Yeah. So if you want to find me, uh, you can find me at alanhide.com. Just a l a n h e i d e dot com. All my socials are my first and last name. Instagram has my middle initial, so it's Alan D Hyde. Um, and I'm on Instagram and then I Love also it. I upload all my uh, breaking the cycle episodes to YouTube uh, and that's just at breaking the cycle podcast if you type it in on YouTube and I do other content under that guys on I YouTube as well. I love it. So um, so this is great. So I knew we were going to do a part two and yeah. it worked out wonderfully because I think going into Easter season, yeah. um, you know, um, such a dark place on Good Friday yeah. um, for the country and the world at that time and and then hope and inspiration and um, nobody better like God totally mm. knew what he was doing yeah. 
Yeah. And your dad, like, mm-hmm. and your coaches. Yeah. A lot of good men. Yeah, a lot of good men, which yeah. we need that in society yeah. today. We talk about that on the show as well, you know, because um, we're, we're in a society today where people are so at odds, you know, oh, bad women, bad men. It's like, there are good people out there and there's always been people I out there. I want to believe that, there's more good than bad. Yeah. But you know, social media, we'll talk about next week, really can wreck yeah. you. Yeah. You have to limit your consumption. Oh, I tell my clients all the time. Yeah, oh, I, 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 it'll wreck me. Like yeah. I can't, it'll wreck me because I feel everything. Yeah. Yeah. And then I can't sleep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, guys. Okay. So part two, um, good Friday, um, at five o'clock, we'll be here live back with Alan. This is amazing. Thank this you so fun. much. Yeah. yeah it's a blast. Part two. Um, so part two. So, uh, we are live on Fishbowl radio network on the Facebook page. I will be uploading this. Um, and then I'm really excited to announce I know we got to wrap, but I'm really excited to announce that um, Fingerprints of Grief is going to be um, in the next three weeks on DB Television Streaming Network uh, 24-7. Um, we'll also have the shows on demand. So after they're on Fishbowl and they go on Spotify and Google Play, then we'll upload Alan's episode. It'll be seen on Google, um, uh, Samsung, LG, Amazon Fire, Roku, and, and several cable channels. Very so it'll be cool. really fun. So I'm excited about that. Thank you to our Lester's producer um we have a beautiful yeah. day so as you see this the, the, the clouds coming through it's really pretty how we started so thank you for lifting my mood um uh, we'll be here next friday at five and then tune in tonight at seven yeah. to breaking the cycle with alan and um on youtube uh on your facebook if you have questions just answer and if you have questions for alan this week send them my way dm me send me a text and we'll we'll bring you on to the show next week cool thank you so much looking forward to it. thank you